Put your, your finger up, hold the page down. Oh, yeah. Oh, now we got two. <laughs> You, can have, you all can have your own pew this morning, by the way. You just sit and space that way. Not space out. Just take space. 
We are a praying people. And so uh, look around the room. And uh, those of you who are at home or watching us at home, look around the room where you are. And take a moment and pray for the person that God has laid on your heart. Let's pray. Father, wherever we are this morning, we are gathered in your presence. For you are absolutely everywhere. Your presence fills the universe. There's not a moment, a thought, an event that occurs even at the smallest level where you are not there. For through you and in you all things hold together. The very breath we breathe is from your hand. This morning, wherever we are, gathered here or at home, we are in your presence, united together by a single, single and simple truth, that you truly are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of all things. And I thank you for that. So Father, I thank you for this day. For the beauty of it, for the promise of uh, snow and moisture, for the promise of good days to come. In all these things, we give you thanks. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. Um, I spoke with uh, some healthcare people, and until such changes occur within the uh, health the, the act kind of thing, um, my understanding is that our musicians are allowed to, because they're 12 feet away from Doug or whatever. They're, they don't have to mask when they're singing, but then when they go back down, and myself as well, that makes that provision. So just if you're watching going, hey, I thought maybe that's the best I could understand. So uh, just that gives that condition. Secondly, you will see the booties up front. And uh, that's a good sign. And there's two pink booties because there's new, two new babies, Scotty and Oakley. Uh, coming to the world and so we want to celebrate with the Elsesser family on the birth of these two little ones and I assume they're healthy and happy and I haven't heard anything anybody heard no? they're good to know good to go and good to know so uh, that is good secondly you'll see the lily up front there and uh, thank you all for your condolences to our family uh, my brother died on Monday night Tuesday night yeah was it Tuesday night Tuesday night hey, he was in the hospital for five days uh, checked in on Thursday and had an inoperable, uh, rare and aggressive form of cancer that went to his liver, uh, and then his kidneys, then his lungs, and then destroyed his bloodstream. So I was able to speak with the ICU nurse Tuesday morning, and she was very realistic about his condition. Um, so we'll be doing something come spring. But as I was getting ready this morning, I made a startling realization about my brother, that we have switched places, that he now knows more about heaven and God and hell than I do, and I now care more about concrete and in building supplies than he does. <laughs> so we made a funny little switch uh, over that time. So I thank you for your condolences. It was uh, a challenging week with all that. But we're here together to worship and to be reminded of the goodness of God. And so we gather together and we sing. And now that you have masks, you can all sing. So sing nice and loud so people know you're here. <laughs> Good morning, like Doug, like Dan, I'll get to Doug yet. Like Dan said, now we've all got to wear masks, so now we better hear some more voices. It's awful lonely up here singing with just the two of us and maybe the three of you, so I nice to hear some more voices this morning. But you notice Doug's got a mask. That makes you ask a couple questions and wonder a couple things, but maybe it's best he is masked instead of let loose to sing. <laughs> just a guess. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, let's <laughs> sing. Please stand with us this morning.
As we go to prayer this morning, we are uh, in the midst, as you all know, of the world that we live in. Our neighbors to the south are trying to sort a few things out still, uh, and there is much to pray for as our schools try to sort out what it means to be in that world as well. And uh, we want to continue to pray for Violet with the passing of Lawrence. There are some uh, funeral cards if you want to pick those up at the back as well, just as a reminder. And thank you for everyone who was able to come and for everyone who was able to watch, watch as well. Let's pray. Father, remind it even as we begin. In the old chorus that says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full into his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I pray in this season that we are going through that our eyes would be fixed firmly on the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him suffered the shame and endured the cross. Father, it's easy for us to get lost. We're sheep that wander sometimes, looking to the hills when the Good Shepherd is right there. Father, I pray that our eyes would be fixed on you, the Good Shepherd, the author of our faith in this season. That we would have hope, and strength, and wisdom, and joy from you. And during this season, we pray for wisdom for each one of us, for that extra measure of patience that we're going to need, for the extra measure of hope and joy in these moments. Father, give us a vision for your kingdom in these days. We pray as we, you have told us to pray for our government leaders. We ask that you give them wisdom and not folly. Give them wisdom and not fear. Give them wisdom in all things and decisions that they make. We pray for our healthcare workers who are beginning to feel overwhelmed. We pray for business owners who are trying to navigate what it means. We pray for healthcare workers, for those at the care center caring there, for those who work with little children, for school teachers, for each and every one, we pray. And we pray for those who are sick. Father, give them strength and give them your healing. As you have taught us to pray, deliver us from evil. Father, this morning we pray for our sister Violet, that you would give her a measure of comfort during this season. We pray for Gerald's wife, Anne, and their family, as Anne tries to navigate what it means, the sudden loss of her husband, and what it means for our family as well, that he's no longer here. Father, grant us grace in this season to speak good words into her life and give her peace. Father, I thank you for each one who's here, whether they're here physically or whether they're here digitally. Thank you for this community of faith that has endured so much over the years. <coughs> Father, grant us strength and give us the joy of your presence this morning. We pray all this in the good name of Jesus. Amen. Please, please stand with us as we continue to worship. <laughs>
you know, so you can sound like an 1890s, you know, uh, coal miner once again. Back in the 1890s, sausage was called bags of mystery, because <laughs> you never knew. Whoever came up with the phrase, there's more than one way to skin a cat, I want to talk to him. It's like, did he try it with one cat? And say, well, let's try another way. There are more ways, it's just a bizarre thing. Um, dog meat, because back in the day, they dug, was called bow wow mutt. <laughs> Bow wow mutton, like sheep. So you could eat a little bow wow mutton if you were really hungry. Um, to be overly extravagant was called putting butter on the bacon. In other words, you don't need to put butter on the bacon. In other words, you're adding more than you require for the moment at the time. Um, a bald man, I don't know if we have any bald people here. Um, their head was called a fly <laughs> ring, because that's where the flies would skate over the top of their head. And my favorite is that a fist, that was called a bunch of fives. You know, give that guy a bunch of fives. So, you know, you kind of, kind of start incorporating those into your day-to-day -day language again, and you'll sound like an 1890s coal miner. Then there were the old phrases, you know, nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs, which if you were a long-tailed cat and there was a room of rocking chairs, you would be somewhat nervous. But uh, I just realized I have more throat than I have shirt. <laughs> Or, I'll be hornswoggled. When was the last time you were personally hornswoggled? Right. Sure. But my favorite of all is, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink unless you put salt in its oats. That's always the little part we don't always think of, you know. Or like the funeral home director who tried to get insurance by driving his coach into the water, and someone said you could lead a hearse to water, but you can't make it sink. <laughs> and, uh, Doug, I need you. <laughs> Back here. <laughs> Unless you put salt in its oats. So it got to me thinking, um, what's the salt in your oats these days? In other words, what's got you thirsty? What's got you thinking? You know, what itch is your soul trying to scratch during these days? And I thought about it a lot this week, and I'll be honest, for me, I've been thinking, I'd like to change the world. Uh, if I had an option, there would be a few things that I would just, uh, like the old song said, if I could have the world the way I want it. So if you were in charge of the world today, we're not going to share, what would the world be like? What would you change? If you were to build paradise for yourself, heaven on earth, what would it be? What would be the perfect environment? We used to raise fish in big fish tanks, and we would always try and create the perfect environment for the fish. Well, one weekend we came home, and our house smelled funny. And what we hadn't noticed was that a cat had climbed on top of the fish tank and he had banged the heater and cranked the heater all the way up and killed all the fish inside the tank with heat. That was the same weekend we came home and Hamby the hamster had got out of the cage and bonkers had eaten him. So, <laughs> if you were to make paradise, maybe Mexico, sun, beach, pools, all the food you could eat, or maybe Cancun or the, the French Riviera, 
maybe Australia in the cool season, or maybe just camping up at Cyprus in the trees would be your example of paradise. I'm not sure. But I know that within each one of us, there is a longing for some place better. We long for paradise. See, someone said, the smell of the lost garden lingers in our memories. So what do we do? We work to make it that way. We redesign and renovate our homes. We build little paradises at the lake. We go on holidays. We try and rebuild paradise around us in some small way. But here's the wonderful thing this morning, beloved. Here's the good news. You don't have to speculate on what paradise looks like. You don't have to build the fish tank. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning, and I trust you've got them, to Revelation chapter 21. We're going to start Galatians next week, but this morning is a bit of an exceptional morning, so I thought I'd take a look at Revelation 21. Let's take a look at what paradise looks like. For it is in this chapter that God reveals to us the perfect environment for us, for his creation. God here builds a home for our great longings. So let's take a look at the home, and then let's take a look at the great longings that home reflects. Revelation 21. We're going to read quite a bit this morning. It starts in verse 1 with this great declaration. The new has come. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now, for those of you who love Mexico and Cancun and the French, well, I'm not sure if anybody's been to the French Riviera here, but we go, well, why wouldn't there be any sea? Well, in ancient culture, sea was the place of terror. Sea was where men went out in ships and never came back home again. Sea was where the monsters and the behemoths were. But we know today, the sea is, while still terrifying, tsunamis and storms can wreak havoc, hurricanes the like. The sea is actually a cleansing agent for the world. It's the salt air that purifies the air. Uh, the Washington Post a few years ago wrote this article. That refreshing breath of sea air may do more than raise your spirits. The world's oceans help clean the atmosphere. It's the salt that does the trick. The conclusion stands that the air that we breathe near the surface remains clean because of the fact that the oceans are salty. In other words, the ocean surface, the air is actually being cleansed by the presence of salt in the water. The ocean cleanses the air. And the implication is here is that when the earth is cleansed, it will no longer need the sea salt to purify the pollution, for it will be perfect in no need of that cleansing agent. So the new heaven has come in perfection and clean. Pick it up in verse 2. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among his people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. This is that beautiful image of the bride and the groom finally meeting after so long. They've, they've been prepared for one another, waiting for one another. And now the groom comes and he brings his household with him and she has been prepared. And rather than us going to him, he will be with us. The words of the prophets for centuries have finally come to pass. Read verse 4. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things will have passed away, and he who is seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. Write this down. These words are trustworthy and true. Within this chapter are what's called the nine no mores. Here we go, ready? No more sea, no more tears, death, sorrow, or crying, or pain. No more evil, no more fear, no more sun or moon, no more night, no more sin or evil, no more disease or injury, and no more curse. This list of the no mores, the things that we would say, oh, I've had enough of that, no more. As my niece Sherry said, after the end of 2020, 2020 can kindly show itself to the door. I've had enough, no more. Well, here we have the great no mores. Sorrow and death 
crime and pain, evil, fear, sin, evil, darkness, disease, injury, the land will not be cursed. No more kosher growing <laughs> on the land. No more picks up through six on. He said to me, I'm the Alpha, the Omega. And he begins to describe what we call the 14 uns, and I won't go through them all. They're contained here in 21 and touching into 22. Here we go. Here's the uns of heaven. Unending fellowship with God. Unending newness. Unending water. Unimaginable beauty. Uncompromised security. Unbroken unity. Unlimited holiness. Unparalleled in size. Untold wealth. Unending light. Unrestricted access. Unending fruit unceasing service, and the unending reign of God himself. This is the great uns in, in heaven, a new Jerusalem. But not all is well, for there are those outside the city. Revelation 21, verse 8. But as for cowards and the unfaithful and the polluted and murderers and fornicators and those who practice magic or worship and idols... And I'm, you know, kind of self-righteous at that point, and I'm feeling pretty good. But then it says, and all liars. <laughs> it's easy to take comfort until you realize that, well, that liars. For there is unending grace. And then comes the long description. We're not going to read it all. It's substantially long. Verses 9 through 21. But if you have your Bibles, just give it a quick glance. For here we have a picture of the physical beauty of the place. We'll pick it up in verse 11. It shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like, like that of a very precious jewel. Like jasper. Clear as crystal. He describes the wall and the gates in verse 12. Verse 13. and Then he talks about the foundations of the walls in verse 14. He measures it in verse 16. 12,000 stadia as wide as long as high. And then he begins to describe its beauty. The wall was made of jasper, the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. 19. The foundations of the city's wall were decorated with every precious stone. Uh, the first foundation was jasper, then sapphire, then agate, then emerald, then onyx, then ruby, then chrysolite, then beryl, then topaz, then turquoise, jacinth, and amethyst. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. I want to see the size of the oyster that made a gate that big. <laughs> Each gate made from a single pearl. The great street of the city was gold as pure as transparent glass. There's an old preacher joke about a fellow who was able to die and he converted all his assets into gold. And as the story goes, he was able to take them with him to the grave. And wouldn't you know it, a miracle occurred. He took them with him to paradise. And he stood before the angel in glory with his great bags of pure gold. The angel walked up and looked him on the shoulder and said, What? You brought pavement? <laughs> it's worth nothing. For the very streets are pure, transparent, and glass. This is the physical description of the city. It's 12 12, the completion, the gates, and the foundation. But it's interesting the stones they choose, because there's a stone missing, and that's diamonds. Diamonds are not included in this list. You'd think diamonds would be. You see, diamonds are isotropic gems. And that is, gems that move in all directions with, where light moves with equal velocity, creating one index of refraction. In other words, if you shine a light through a diamond, it puts a, this color spectrum, right? And it's even. But the stones that are listed here are called anastropic gems. And that is, light enters anastropic gem material, and light is split into different polarizing rays. Uh, the materials of the, di of the minerals possess the power to polarize the light. In other words, they produce rainbows, sparkling rainbows, as the light polarizes and changes directions through the lights. And these 12 stones are anastropic. And combined with the light of glory, you get a rainbow-colored city. As the light shines through, the city glitters with rainbow light. There's an image for you. 
Not those things you buy for the side of your house at Christmas, you know, that put the rainbow. Um, <laughs> this entire city, as the light of God is radiating through it, radiates not with a fixed spectrum of light, but with radiating, twinkling, rainbow light. It's glorious in its image. Who knew? No diamonds. Just anastropic gems. 22 through 27 brings us to the end of the chapter this morning. And here there's something missing. And I didn't see a temple in the city. Why? Well, why not have a temple? That would be, you know, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city doesn't need a sun or a moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light. And the Lamb is its lamp. And the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. So I guess they get to bring their gold with them. On no day will its gates be shut, for there will be no night. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. I think he's talking about praise and worship. Nothing impure will enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. For there is no temple, for God will be present, no sun or moon, for the light and the glory of God will shine around it. Such is the glory of this place. The great city. The bride has come, no more an unending. This chapter, in turn then, speaks of our great longing. For we long for glory. We long for peace. We long for beauty. These are the very things. But I want to share with you this morning three great longings that we as humans have that are fulfilled in this place. And hopefully give you something to look forward to. The first thing we long for is we long for abundance as people. We don't want just the bare minimum. We don't want just enough to get. I know we're supposed to be content, but let's face it. We want lots. There's something in us. Someone said we're only poor when we want more, but there's something in us that wants abundance. I've been to rooms that have more than two guns in them. There is an abundance when you walk in there. Hockey card collections that you keep in boxes. Cars, trucks, motorcycles, several airplanes. Just salt shakers. Remember when people collected spoons? Why did your mother need those? You had spoons in the drawer, but no, she had a wall under glass, so they didn't get dusty, of spoon after spoon after spoon because we collect. <laughs> One time dad was visiting us years ago and he saw our movie collection. My father-in-law looked and said, are, all, are those all the movies ever made? <laughs> I said, well, no, Dad, that's just a tiny fraction. But probably like you, a wall of movies. Shelves of books, well-stocked pantries, and yes, shops with too many tools. We long for an abundance, because let's face it, you don't need a five-pound pail of rusty bolts, but you've got it. <laughs> we long for abundance. There's something in us. And so what happens when God is present? He fills our lives with abundance. Let me read you just a few verses. Psalm 36, 8, They will drink their fill of the abundance of your house. And you give them to the drink of the river of your delights. Jeremiah 31, 14, I will fill the soul of the priest with abundance, and my people will be satisfied with my goodness. Jeremiah 33, 6, Behold, I will bring to it health and healing, and I will heal them, and I will reveal to them an abundance of peace and truth. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, And God is able to make all grace abound, so that you will always have an all sufficiency in everything. You may have an abundance for every good deed. And lastly, Romans 8, 37, but in all these things, we are overwhelmingly conquerors. Abundant victory. You see, where God is present, there isn't just enough. There's abundance of joy. There's an abundance of his delights. There's an abundance of his goodness, of peace and trust. An abundance that we can do every good deed. An abundant victory. From garden to paradise, God's presence reveals his abundance. The fruit of the Spirit is an abundant tree. Rivers of living water flow and cascade out of us as the Spirit is present. We are to live in overwhelming victory. 
We long for abundance, and the great city carries that promise. Secondly, we long for beauty. There is something inherent in us as human beings. We long for beauty. Someone said, while animals are beautiful, humans create beauty. We create it all the time. We create pageants, fashion. When I bought my mask, it said right on it, fashion mask, not a medical device. <laughs> not confidence inspired, I'll tell you that. What do we do? We create design, furniture, homes, you comb your hair and get it cut. You create art. Our cars aren't little boxes. They're beautiful. We create beauty because we long for beauty. Whether it's handcrafts or as Donna said, when you serve food, the first bite we take is with our eyes. And if it's not beautiful, we might go, hmm, I'm not sure about that. We may question taste, but the individual thinks it's beautiful. And while there may not be a universal standard for beauty, there is a universal desire. God has created us to long for beauty. And of course then, where God is, there's beauty. Psalm 96, 6. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Isaiah 61, 3. And provide for those who grieve to bestow upon them the crown of beauty instead of ashes. Jeremiah 13, 20, lift up your eyes and see those coming from the north. Where is the flock that has been given to you? Your beautiful sheep. Yes, even cows and sheep are beautiful. Romans 10, 15, how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of the gospel. Even our feet are beautiful in God's presence. And so the new Jerusalem surrounds our longing for beauty to be surrounded with it from the light to the design to its fit and finish. Our longing for beauty is fulfilled within the new kingdom. And lastly, we long for belonging. We want to belong, to feel not alone, to feel connected. Most people are looking for someone or somewhere to belong to. From gangs to clubs, to brand named items, to our family identity, to our Saskatchewan Rough Rider. I like what one church in Winnipeg said, put on the mask, we're not asking you to wear a Toronto Blue Jays, no, a Toronto Maple Leafs jersey. But we long to connect and to belong. And so what happens, of course, where God is, there is belonging. To the children of Israel, he says, let my people go. Israel would be God's people, his bride, his chosen people. And so what does Ephesians 2.19 tell us this morning? So that you're no longer strangers or aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. You are God's household. And in God's household, there's room for more than five. All are welcome. In the New Testament, we're a household. We're a body of many different pieces. We're an army of soldiers fighting the good, good fight. Or even a group of people going fishing together. All these are images of belonging. All these are images of my beloved. And so the church cries out this morning. We cry out to each one. Through Christ Jesus, you belong to us. Your identity is in him. You are part of this body. The New Jerusalem calls out, this is your home, you belong. Have you ever been in a place where you feel like you don't belong? You feel awkward and uncomfortable. You, know, you walk into a situation, you don't know the rules, you don't know the behavior, and you just, your brain screams, I don't belong here. I'll never forget we were in aggravation one time. <laughs> and I was pulling it off. I felt pretty good about myself. I had boots on, I had jeans. And somebody tried to sell me calf pulling chains. It was great. I let him go on for three or four minutes. He kept going, going. He said, so do you need some? I said, I own a cat. Do you have small ones? But, uh, he wasn't very happy after that. But, uh, but that feeling of, yeah, you know, maybe I belong. That's a great feeling. And in the church of Jesus, the body of Christ, we belong. You are home. I will be your God. And they will be children. 
Now we have to put a little warning bell off here, because all three can become easily corrupted. Abundance, well that could become greed. Last night we sat down for a supper, we had chicken and stuffing and rice and vegetables and dessert and coffee. And what happens an hour later, Donna and I are sitting watching TV, she says, so do you want anything? I said, I could use a snack. <laughs> Abundance can become an issue. Beauty, well that can become vanity, it can become idolatry, we recognize those problems. And belonging, well belonging can become a source of pride and a way of dividing people and saying, you're not a part of my group, you don't belong. But all three are the signs of the presence of God. Where he is, there is abundance, there is beauty, and there is belonging. And so God meets us at our deepest human needs. In the eternal city, there is abundance, there is beauty, and there is belonging. And while we wait that, for that coming day, I believe that we can experience some of that even today. That some of the deepest longings of our hearts can be met in this lifetime. For until the kingdom comes in the here and now, I believe that through the body of Jesus Christ, through the glory and the beauty of the world around us, we can experience these things. For in the family of God, there is abundance. Together we have physical resources. We have an abundance of family here this morning. There can be an abundance of joy as we get together. Even an abundance of hope, of comfort, of energy. No one should be alone. And we look around at creation and God has given us the beauty of this place around us. Here and now we can know beauty, music, and art. Drama and design, needlepoint, crochet, wood burning, welding, I don't know what you do. Pet the dog and clean your horse. Whatever it is, beauty. That's why we have a church beautification committee. That this place would be beautiful. As the psalmist says, strength and beauty are in the san his sanctuary. Psalm 69, 9 says, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. There should be beauty in this place. And today there can be belonging. Belonging to the family of God. For you are all baptized into Christ. You have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Our belonging is not tied to what we earn, what we wear, or the color of our hair. I did a punk wedding one time. They were hardcore punks. They all got new tattoos for the wedding. It was very cool. Um, no one wore shoes at the wedding. It was outside. And they asked me, I said, what can I do to belong? What can I express my sense of identity with these people who are so outside my comfort zone? I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to dye my hair blue. That's what I'm going to do. So I went downtown to the drugstore in small town, Saskatchewan. And you know what they didn't have in the drugstore, Teresa? They didn't have any temporary dye. Oh, yeah. They only had permanent dye. So I bought permanent blue, and I found one of the girls in the high school and said, I want you to dye my hair blue. She looked at me like, okay, whatever. So I went to her house and dyed my hair blue, and it was fairly long at the time, and I got to do this punk wedding with blue hair. It was great, and they all chuckled, and to this day, she says, I remember you dyed your hair blue for us. Thank you. But now here's the fun part. The next week, I had a traditional conservative Chinese wedding. Very conservative. You cannot go to a traditional conservative Chinese wedding with blue hair. I said, what am I going to do? So I shaved my head. Got rid of it. But I'm not good at that. I've never done that before. So the girl, uh, I think her name, I can't remember her name, Mary we'll call her. I asked her, the day, I said, do you remember when I shaved my head for the wedding? She says, yes, all I remember was that you had fine blue fur <laughs> at our wedding. I, I just, I don't know. Hello. We can, doesn't matter what color your hair is. Doesn't matter what you wear, what you drive, what your ethnic or cultural background. We are in Christ Jesus. Wise or unwise. Let no one boast in men for all things belong to you. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come. All things belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. You belong. So this morning, we wait. We wait for the coming of the King 
to usher in his great and eternal kingdom. And we go shopping and we look at the world, we watch the news, and we cry out, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But until that day, while it's still today, while it's still 2020, and today isn't easy. But until that day, we can taste the abundance of God. We can experience the beauty of his creation and know the belonging of his kingdom. And I know today is not an easy day. It is not an easy season. But beloved, I was thinking about us as a people and I realized something. We are survivors. Since this church began in 1913, here's what I've come to the conclusions. We have survived snow, wind, drought, fire, two world wars, and a cold war. We've seen the Spanish flu, the Asian flu, smallpox, diphtheria, polio, rheumatic fever, scarlet fever, measles, mumps, and chickenpox, and I probably missed a few. We survived prairie madness, the end of the crow, the sale of the wheat pool, 47 years of the NDP, and not one, but two Trudeau governments. <laughs> we have survived. We are the people of the storm. We put rocks in our pockets when we walk, and we know that a three-dog night isn't a band. It's how many dogs you put in bed when it's cold. <laughs> and in the midst of all of this, we get a little foretaste of glory this morning. A little foretaste of the glory to come. We rest in his abundant presence. We find comfort in his abundant hope. And we trust in his abundant promise. Now let him have the last word. For I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Let's pray. Father, you know that this season is not easy. For some it's not easy because of the death of a loved one. For some it's not easy for our brother Peter because of his sickness. For some, it's not easy because there's new babies in the world and sleepless nights and long days ahead. For some, it's not easy because little ones are coming into the world. For parents and grandparents, it's not easy to watch their children and wonder about tomorrow. For some, it's not easy because they're alone and the days are long and the nights perhaps even longer. For some, it's not easy because there are financial concerns and wondering about tomorrow. For some, it's not easy because we just are frustrated and we wonder what the end game of everything is going to be. But this morning, you shine the light of your abundant hope, the light of your abundant comfort, the light of your abundant presence and your abundant promises upon us. And we recognize that this present suffering is nothing compared with the glory to come. Father, we fix our eyes on Jesus this morning. We fix your eyes on you. And we pray this in the good name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless.